Uh, yeah, now it's on. And maybe if I could have the first introduction uh, image. Uh, I'm Ioana Teokaropoulou. Um, I uh, am a co-founder of the Ecogram series of events here at GSAP. I'm an alum of the school and I used to teach here when I started the, um, these events. Um, there, uh, what is, first I'm going to say what is Ecogram. Um, and what are you know? What is the purpose of this event? And then I'm going to hand over to my uh, colleague and and, and um, co-curator for this conference, uh, Jeff Johnson, um, who will discuss uh, the work that Columbia does at in China in China Lab. So, um, what is Ecogram? So, Ecogram is a series of uh, events, exhibits, uh, and conferences and, at, at GSAP, each time designed around a set of questions particularly in relation to cities and the built environment. Um, I think we could have a little more light. Um, okay, the main question that we pose each year is what is sustainability and does it mean the same things in different geographical, cultural, economic contexts? More and more, we're interested in interrogating sustainability with a general assumption that it is both a physical and a social issue and that cities, particularly rapidly growing ones, are central to any idea of sustainability. We began to have a sense of the complexities involved in addressing these questions with last year's ecogram, the first to focus on a particular region, Africa. We invited a number of distinguished artists, architects, and scholars uh, in African history and art, who gave us a kind of portrait or map of some of the specific complexities of the African context and who shared with us how they are responding to them. Um, what started to become apparent last year was a sense of a new kind of social and ecological sustainability that seems to be about a more empathetic, sort of user-centered approach to architecture and design um, which, um, with, with a commitment uh, to impact the whole process of building and uh, an appreciation of creativity and ingenuity that is already inbuilt in local design traditions, but at the same time, an active and ongoing uh, connection to larger global networks. This year, we're looking to address the following. Does sustainability, a concept launched in the Western world, need significant rethinking in the context of China? Is there a China experience? What are the unique political, social, and economic structures that are the background against which contemporary Chinese architecture is taking shape? Um, as Howard French wrote in a letter from China in the New York Times recently, quote, things are changing fast in China, and not just the kind of surface change of rapid growth and um, omnipresent construction, politics are changing too as a result of a hard to quantify still combination of tinkering at the top and effervescent bottom up civic growth." End quote. Tonight, we will explore what particular models and approaches can we look at, what kinds of experiences can we draw from China that can enrich our own um, understanding uh, and responses to sustainability. So I, with this, I hand over to my colleague, Jeff Johnson. Uh, thanks, Joanna. Um, obviously, it's, it's uh, great to sort of participate in Ecogram 4. Um, and, and, and it's only too obvious to, to explain that sort of sustainability and the sort of broad reaching uh, thinking about sustainability is important for uh, for us at China Lab and, and considering and researching uh, the contemporary city. Um, just a little background, again, I'm the sort of founding director of, of China Lab, uh, which has since been renamed China Mega Cities Lab, to even sort of focus, again, even more on the topics that uh, interest us, uh, which have to do with rapid urbanization, and particularly, obviously, in China, and how those sort of consequences uh, implications of urbanization will have uh, sort of uh, uh, effects on the way that we think about urbanization, not only in China, uh, but throughout the world. And certainly uh, within the institution here, within GSAP, 
um, what we can learn from China is very important. Um, and uh, again, the sort of the ability to sort of participate in a conference like this, uh, starting on Friday uh, today and then also tomorrow, uh, again is sort of paramount in in sort of its goal to sort of redefine or reconsider or as uh, Joanna defines, sort of interrogate our preconceptions about sustainability, in its sort of far-reaching um, uh, sort of effects. Uh, again, being in sort of a design school, one generally just thinks that the importance has to do with, one, how we conceive of things, how we design things, and, and those implications. But obviously, sustainability has a far, uh, far uh, sort of uh, reaching uh, consequence and goals uh, dealing with politics, society, et cetera. So again, as architects and urban thinkers, it's important for us to understand all of these uh, sort of forces and mechanisms that are at play to, to sort of help better understand the issues uh, for which we are designing for. Um, again, the, the idea that uh, for us within China Lab is in a sense to redefine the urban project for us. What we can learn from China as sort of a window or a portal as Saskia Sassen uh, also mentioned on Friday important uh, for us to, to understand urbanization and contemporary condition through its very specific kind of conditions but also in a, in a sort of generalized sense to where it might in a sense form new paradigms or emerging urbanisms within the Chinese condition that we can then apply to other uh, sort of urbanizing areas around the world. So again, that's very important. Um, Obviously, uh, when we talk about cities in China, uh, you know, the last 30 years we've seen a urban growth. Uh, China was about just under 20 percent urban uh, uh, only in 1980 uh, to today, somewhere between 40 to 50 percent urban. Uh, but what's important, so that's 30 years, so what happened in a single generation took America uh, 100 years uh, and took Europe almost 200 years uh, to conceive in that sort of rapid pace towards urbanization. Uh, again, all fueled through sort of industrialization. Uh, but also what's important today is that this is sort of projections going to continue. This sort of trend uh, uh, is, is again projected that um, by 2030 that that uh, growth will be around, or urban population will be around uh, or maybe 70 percent. Uh, so therefore we're talking about hundreds of millions of people still moving towards urban areas. And again, this sort of trend of rapid urbanization should continue over the next 30, 40, or even 50 years, if not beyond. So again, uh, not only is it something that we study sort of a, through a contemporary condition or even historically, but something that it's important to understand as we project this forward and thinking about cities. Uh, and we talk about sustainability. Uh, also, we're talking about issues that we, we already know that sort of China has sort of surpassed the United States uh, in carbon emissions. Uh, not per capita, but as, as a sort of entire, sort of its uh, quantitative total, um, but also in its sort of energy uh, use. Um, so it's also important when we think about the growth in cities, though we know that the cities themselves and, and sort of dense urban areas are very sustainable, uh, still the built environment, that of which we design and that of which uh, we sort of maintain, is sort of uh, uh, produce um, the majority of our energy usage. Uh, so therefore, the way we think about design in cities is also sort of important when we think about sustainability. But again, as I said, it's not just about built environment, but it's also about social and economic uh, equality uh, and issues uh, that are very important. For example, some of the, uh, the panels that were discussed on Friday had to do with sort of the, the, the huge or large uh, floating population of migrant workers which make up about you know, anywhere between 150 to 250 million people at any given time. And their sort of temporary condition and how to consider how to integrate them into the community or the city is also very important. So here we see that not only design but also social and economic factors are very important which obviously have to do with policy and politics as well. So um, I, I could go on, but I think the idea here is that I'm trying to explain that the, obviously these things are all important. It's, it's sort of beyond the idea of design and that we sort of hope that through this, again, through the interrogating the notion of the definition of sustainability, we can have a better understanding of these sort of conditions uh, within China and obviously uh, to help us think about urbanization uh, throughout the world and sort of the definition of sustainability across disciplines and across different kind of uh, political, social, and economic uh, additions, anyway. Um, so thank you, and uh, thank you, Lucia and uh, Gavin, for all your help. And I think what we're going to do, so just for the format, we have four 
speakers, or five, four groups, let's say, as speakers, and we'll introduce each one as they come, and then we hopefully at the end we'll have a little time for panel discussion. So we'll, we'll just introduce each one. And so the first is Jung Jun. And uh, just, John Jung is a designer, editor, and critic. He has been working on urban research and experimental uh, study, exploring the interrelationship between design, phenomenon, and urban dynamic. He founded Underline Office in late 2003 and has been the editor-in-chief of Urban China Magazine since the end of 2004. In the meantime, working on a book, High China. Now he's associate professor in Guangzhou Academy of Fine Arts, a project director at Streco School of Architecture, Design, and Media in Moscow, and visiting scholar at Oxford University. And uh, again, welcome you back, Zhang Jun, a good friend and a good friend of the school. Thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, as you know, uh, during the past five years, I was doing a magazine called Urban China, and I think the opportunity was given by a very uh, unique situation in China that we have a very rapid growth in, in economy and uh, we have a relatively sustainable social stability. And uh, uh, the reform was called gradual reform, which is very different from the shock therapy model in Russia. And uh, the reform was uh, taking place in the different levels. And uh, every level, uh, um, uh, earlier or later, actually uh, uh, very interesting in all the different senses. So uh, this is an opportunity for me to uh, elaborate what is modernization in the Chinese context and uh, every topic uh, was launching in different issues. So last year I, I uh, quit the job and my focus was more uh, switched to the uh, context uh, uh, outside China. And uh, Purvis works were more or less like uh, ontological work of China itself, but the uh, recent work was more about comparative, comparative uh, study uh, between China and other developing countries and uh, even developed countries. So uh, this week I made a very interesting trip from, from first from China and then from, uh, to, from China to Amsterdam where I participated in a forum called Social Housing and then I went to Cuba, where I, I met some ministers and also very local peasants who were talking about the, uh, the Cuban-style socialism reform in which the uh, privatized uh, business is permitted and uh, the peasant are, is going to rent uh, land from the government for more uh, efficient social economy. And then I come up here and yesterday I interviewed some uh, Occupy Wall Street people. Uh, so through all these different trips I find out there's something in common. Everybody is now talking about socialism. So basically today I'm going to talk also talk about socialism but uh, also to find out uh, what is the ultimate problem with our uh, world and, and finally I will uh, conclude in my lecture, uh, my talk in ecology. Yeah. So basically I'm going to give a, a background of what was the problem in our ecology and uh, environment. So um, basically I, I will start my talk uh, from a general framework I used for uh, two or three years uh, in Urban China Magazine. Uh, it's kind of combination of the theory by uh, Darwin and Marx, and uh, it's it's uh, uh, indication that uh, uh, our uh, civilization or our human activities are basically based on nature first, and then the human activities are uh, uh, could be divided into different uh, layers or what I call dimensions and then those dimensions has a mutual effect to each other uh, which somehow created a different all the different conflicts so uh, first uh, this is the framework uh, I use uh, geography here to replace ecology because uh, a ge geography basically has two dimensions one dimension is that we have we have all the resources on planet but on the other hand we also have a uh, geopolitical location value in which uh, uh, which is not necessarily related to uh, natural resources but to the locations 
And then our um, economic uh, activities are based on this uh, geographical uh, map. And then uh, uh, we need to have a social organization to organize all our uh, economical activities. And then the political regime to organize the social organizations, all the pixelized uh, social organizations. And finally, uh, we have uh, culture uh, accumulated from all these human organizations. And then uh, Karl Marx used to classify uh, these dimensions into uh, uh, base and uh, superstructure. So we have the natural uh, base, which is geography and the economic base. And then we also have superstructure included, including political superstructure and uh, cultural superstructure. And the political superstructure is kind of a complementary structure between the state politics and the social organization. So that is the framework for our analysis today. And I want to start from, uh, started my talk from the com compare of the different models to organize our uh, human activities uh, on the ecology first. So the, uh, the first model is called, what I call the top-down socialism, which is Chinese model, you can say. And uh, uh, top-down socialism, uh, you can say, uh, started from Soviet Union, because Soviet Union is, is kind of very typical, centralized, and top-down, plain economy, uh, in which the politics and central governments are very powerful in organizing and uh, implementing social and natural uh, economical resources. And uh, this model actually uh, is based on a, a basic regime that all the uh, uh, production factors and the means, production means are owned by the public. So it's called public ownership. And the second model is called bottom-up socialism, in which the society are uh, more dominating and uh, 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 the government is more about serving the people. And this model uh, uh, is very typical in uh, Europe, especially in North Europe, uh, in which uh, the government are very small and playing a very simple role in serving the society by claiming high taxes from enterprises, especially bigger enterprises, and uh, providing high social welfare uh, to the society, uh, which created a kind of uh, social welfare state. And then the third model is, is uh, I can call the bottom-up capitalism. And this, cap uh, this regime is uh, based on the private ownership. In the United States, it's uh, even uh, more extreme than other countries because the, uh, some basic resources here, I mean core resources here, including uh, the uh, energy or weapon uh, manufacturing or uh, even the central bank are private owned, which is, uh, I think, is this basic reason behind the general crisis that takes place nowadays. And then, uh, uh, in this model, uh, somehow, there is, uh, at least the Republicans are uh, claiming low taxes to encourage the entrepreneur and uh, given uh, low uh, social welfare to the society. And, uh, and, and this is called a neoliberalism, and, uh, especially overwhelming uh, since 1980s. And uh, people are always comparing Thatcher and Reagan and Deng Xiaoping in, uh, in China as the start of neoliberalism. However, uh, the Chinese leaders actually have an agenda uh, uh, to start from neoliberalism, but uh, going forward into the new socialism, which I will talk about later. And here, uh, there is a combination or incorporation of neoliberalism into the socialism body in, uh, ever since 1980s in which the core resources, for example, the land and the energy and uh, some basic infrastructure are owned by the public. However, uh, the private business in the micro social economy uh, are, uh, were given freedom. And uh, the private ownership uh, were given to all these layers of properties. So uh, the extreme uh, 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 distinction between the public and private are here are uh, blurred. And uh, the property rights in China are layered into different rights, including the rights of ownership, the right of usership, and the rights of management, uh, right of distribution, and the right of 
uh, beam benefit, so on and so forth, so that uh, the uh, gradual reform can be possible. And uh, on the other end, on the other side of the world, uh, there is also a very interesting combination of the uh, second model and third model. Uh, because here, uh, uh, especially in Europe and the uh, United States, um, uh, there are a multi-party or two-party system. And one party sometimes gives high social welfare, uh, welfare by uh, claiming high taxes. And other parties are given uh, low social welfare by claiming low social taxes. But uh, when the mutual structure works, uh, the result is actually about low taxes together with the high social welfare. And uh, because of this imbalanced uh, circulation of finance, and finally, uh, the countries are living on high debts. And this is uh, uh, clearly a very uh, insustainable uh, structure. And, uh, I, I, and I think you also believe uh, that a country living on high debts is totally uh, very, very impossible to invest uh, their budget into the environmental issues. <coughs> so uh, secondly, I would like to talk about the measures uh, we were taken to cope with our ecological issues. Uh, basically, uh, there are three topologies uh, in uh, all these measures. The first one we can, we can say is called light green. So this green is founded on a basis of preserving the existing regimes and the political economic structures. And uh, the, government, the government or the political system is, is untouched. And uh, the, uh, the society are forcing the government to give more green policies and given, uh, the, uh, forcing the enterprises uh, to give more green technologies. Uh, so, for example, BP is claiming itself to be the most environmental uh, uh, protective enterprise in the world, which is actually a, uh, a, a compensation of the pollution it made uh, before. Or Starbucks also said, that I'm preserving the forest in Colombia, so on and so forth. So this is a kind of um, a conservative strategy in uh, environmental issues. And uh, in, culture, in a cultural sense, uh, uh, this is called green modernization because uh, the uh, environment protection on this sense is based on modernization and development. But it should be entitled with green and sustainable. And I think uh, including architects ourselves are in this technological uh, dimension. And we are helping our existing world to do better, but not so much. And then the second typology of environmental issues is called the deep green, we say deep green. And the, the, the deep green start especially from 1960s uh, by a group of environmentalists, especially in the 1960, late 1960s movements. And uh, some uh, students and young people uh, at that time are now growing up into some powerful political parties, especially in Europe. And, uh, the basic philosophy of uh, this movement from the 1960s is actually uh, shifting the uh, human-centric or anthropocentric uh, orientation of our modernization into ecology centrism. So I think this is a very important uh, shift because it's actually go back to some uh, tradition. But uh, people are also very skeptical about this uh, U-turn uh, from modernization to pre-modernization, especially in a very competitive world. When some countries are less developed in modernization, uh, it's very risky and, uh, uh, in the com competition uh, with the other, uh, other countries. In some, uh, some other develop, de developed countries, uh, uh, some people are also part of the movement called anti-consumerism because consum consumption-oriented urbanization is one of our biggest problems and this is also obviously very unsustainable. <clears throat> and during the same time, the social movements also are very diversified and ever since 1960s, we have all the different agendas uh, from all the different social organizations, uh, including anti-racism uh, and the feminism, student union, labor union, peasant union, so on and so forth. And some of the uh, organizations actually connected or incorporate their agenda together with uh, uh, ecological centrism or uh, environmentalist. 
So for example, anti-racism is really about um, stimulating the biodiversity of the society or of the human race. And the feminism is more about uh, taking the capitalism modernization way uh, as a patriarchal, patriarchal way of development, but the pre-modern way is more like uh, a female and uh, more like a mother. So all this metaphor actually gives us indications that the different movement in the nepotism history is, 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 is kind of meeting each other. And uh, in the political level, uh, the, uh, the, the, there are two different orientations. One orientation is, of course, called anti-capitalism. And uh, uh, this is already realized centuries ago, and the Chinese still now on the track. And China is now calling itself uh, socialism with Chinese characteristic, which is, uh, which is uh, what I call incorporating the system market into the planning system. On the other hand, there is also a movement called Green uh, Anarchism. And uh, this is more or less similar to Chinese tradition, traditional philosophy in Taoism. And Taoism is, uh, is actually about disable the function of government, especially central government and uh, have the people living organically and uh, auton uh, autonomically uh, by themselves as uh, an organic part of the nature and uh, based on the economy of agriculture. So well, when all this movement coming up and together with uh, the conservative uh, measures of the existing world, uh, we can say maybe this gives us a new possibility of new socialism, and uh, socialism is not polluted, uh, such a polluted world is especially after, after the failure of the socialism world, uh, after the Cold War, and um, uh, there are so many different branches of socialism, and it's very dangerous to talk about uh, new socialism, but anyway, I would still would like to uh, ex uh, extend this tradition of socialism uh, uh, by giving its original uh, idealistic, uh, uh, idealistic perspective of the world, uh, uh, giving a comprehensive uh, consideration of the society, of the ecology, and, uh, and the culture. So uh, yesterday, I, I went to, when I went to Zuccotti, I uh, saw this table in a small park, and uh, we, we can notice that the different agendas of all the 1960s uh, social movement are now putting up together on the same table, uh, including sexuality and socialism, ecology and socialism, women socialism, and so on and so forth. So, for me, this is a very exciting moment that the new socialism uh, could be an uh, inclusive way for all the previous uh, nepotism movement. And uh, the, there is a possibility for the reconciliation of all these different agenda, and uh, we, we, can, we can think about a new way of uh, socialism. So uh, there is a th uh, uh, scholar, I forget his name, he talked about, he gave a name uh, uh, to this new socialism. He said this is about uh, inclusive demo demo democratism. So I think this is a, a possible way in giving a new title if uh, socialism was really polluted our world. So secondly, I would like to talk about uh, the, uh, the case in China by talking about the tradition of plan economy. Because plan uh, was supposed to be a way to overcome the barbaric uh, nature of capitalism, uh, especially when the capitalism is becoming uh, bigger and bigger to uh, infiltrate itself into other disciplines, into the society, politics, and the culture, and ecology. So uh, the tradition of socialism uh, uh, was taking the plan system as a very a rigid way in which all the uh, production measures are uh, nationalized or publicized. So uh, this is a, a, a very fundamental socialism, as I, as I said, and uh, uh, we call it plan economy. As my time is very limited, I would like to jump all the uh, transitional transformation of this plan economy, and we, let's jump directly to the uh, current situation. Uh, uh, early this year, the, the title of plan economy or uh, uh, a five-year plan were trend, uh, changed into five-year planning. And I think this is a very important change because 
the dynamic function or role of the government were hi highlighted in, in this term, in this terminology. And uh, the government are no longer give direct command to our economy, especially to the microeconomy, which is uh, uh, one of the biggest failures in the planned time, uh, which is also why the planned economy uh, was so in inefficient uh, during the 1950s, 1970s in China. And now, uh, if the, the term was changed from plan to planning, uh, uh, the command was changed in, uh, from direct command into the direction uh, strategies. So this is a uh, very interesting change and this is also uh, something similar to what we did in urban planning because we, we never say urban plan, we say urban planning because we are not predictors of our future so we have to make a flexible framework of our space uh, to prepare for all the changes coming uh, in the future. So uh, the basic uh, transformation of uh, Chinese five-year plan uh, is actually about uh, giving uh, or in introducing the market system uh, into the social uh, economy level but preserving the plan system or planning system in the macroeconomy level. So this is one big change. By this change, the government is able to um, uh, make a, make an if efficient transfer payment uh, through the taxing of financial system in uh, investing into other dimensions, including the ecology and society and the culture. So, uh, uh, ever since this year, we can see a process of uh, the heightening, uh, how to say, increasement of the social welfare, uh, especially recently, the, uh, the minimum salary uh, of the personal in tax was uh, increased from uh, 1500 to uh, 3000 and uh, we can also see there's a, a, a series of uh, very strong and powerful measures in controlling uh, the uh, carbon emissions into the environment and so on and so forth and uh, uh, emanation of uh, the uh, competi uh, less competitive and the polluting enterprises uh, from the uh, industries. And also the culture and uh, in, in creative industry sponsorship, so on and so forth. So, uh, I would like to say uh, this is a very uh, typical way in China itself because China has a lot of uh, special characteristics but basically I think uh, in, um, by combining the macro public and the micro private I think the um, advantage of uh, socialism and uh, capitalism can be inc incorporated. But on the other hand, uh, when, when we come up to the United States, I, have, I had a feeling that uh, here the world is, uh, is kind of uh, on the opposite because the, uh, there is a strong tradition here of the public spaces and uh, all the squares are now activated into a kind of Occupy Wall Street spaces and uh, with Zukunti as a center and other squares as the satellites. However, to the top of the economy and the political regime is totally private. So for me, it's a, it's a very interesting compare um, between China and the United States. Uh, I would like to end my, my, my talk here. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'd like to now introduce uh, Professor Diabo Lu, who is a professor of political science here at Columbia and at Barnard College. Um, he is the founding director of Columbia Global Centers in East Asia, Beijing, founded in Beijing 2008 to 10. Uh, he has taught in China. He was a visiting professor at Tsinghua University, uh, also at Renmin and uh, Zhongshan and Beijing universities. Uh, Professor Lu teaches courses on Chinese politics, political economy, and comparative politics. His research interests include post-socialist transition, corruption and good governance, regulatory reforms, and government business relations. Um, uh, he is also a member of uh, the Council on Foreign Relations and the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. Please help me welcome Xiaobo Lu.
Thank you very much. It's very interesting, as you may notice, that it's a quite cross-border here. You know, an architect, designer talk about politics, and I am a political science talking about urban development. It's actually quite interesting. Um, I, um, I probably won't share, even though I'm going to talk also about a political factor, the political I have to bring in, of course. Um, I'm as rosy and romantic as, as uh, Professor Zhang is because, uh, as I will show you a couple of photos and uh, images, then you'll see that I, my argument, I even doesn't use the word urban planning because to me, maybe uh, Jeffrey Johnson who has some experience in designing in China, the urban, really there is no urban planning, ironically, it is all kind of development um, uh, ad hoc. And there's a reason to it, and that's the political uh, institutional uh, reasons behind it. Let me explain it. Now, let me start with the image because um, I guess as architect, you, you always like to see images. Uh, this is an image of the, uh, believe it or not, the longest bridge in the world, the longest ocean, ocean uh, 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 bridge in the world, uh, probably the, by far any bridges. It's, well, it's, let, let me give you a little bit. It designed as, uh, let me see, this is opened, by the way, this is, uh, uh, was opened uh, March, uh, June 30th this year. All right, it's really fascinating. And the longest, guess which is the second longest? Which is the third longest, where, the, where, they, where they are? They're both in China. And interestingly, the reason I, want, I don't want to give you the actual length is because this is the designed length. It's 35.6 kilometers long. That's a designed one. When it first designed, actually 13 years ago, and it was started, the, the, the construction started late 2005, 2006. It took five years to complete. Now, of course, the actual the actual now, the claim to be the length is 45 kilometers. And you wonder why? Because the second longest, or the longest at that time, because if you, if you, look, if you look at the history that the, the bridge designed, actually claimed to be the second longest after the Hangzhou, uh, uh, Hangzhou Bay Bridge in Zhejiang province. Right, that one is 36 kilometers long, which I happen to have a chance from, Jiang, uh, you, you can drive from Shanghai to Hangzhou, you know, to Ningbo and by, by that bridge, which is really long. And of course, at that time, it was second longest. And it's no, you know, of course, in China's case, it's always competition. I will explain why that happened. And third longest happened to be, I believe also in, in, the, in, in, in China, is the, uh, the Donghai, the East Sea, China, East Chinese Sea Bridge, which links uh, a Shanghai city to, uh, the city of Shanghai to, uh, to the, uh, the outlying uh, 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 islands. Uh, and, uh, and only served, I believe, the purpose of linked the islands, and, and, and it, you need, it was uh, probably, it's, it's the third longest, 25 kilometers, if I'm not, not wrong. But let's come back to this one. Why this one should arouse our attention. If you look at uh, what happens, this is the Bohai, this is the Bohai, uh, the Bohai Bay, the Marker Bay, but this is a smaller bay uh, near Qingdao, right? This is a Qingdao. Qingdao City is right here. That's a Qingdao city. And here is the Huangxian, a county, a secondary kind of a, a, a developing or growing uh, county. And really nothing much in between. So then you also see this is another uh, high speed road. And that's a highway, right? So this, this is the bridge. The yellow line is the bridge. The bridge actually cut only about 25 minutes, maximum. 22, 25 minutes. All right, 30 kilometers. That's what the shortened. Then the question is, why this is the project? Why you want to do a project like this? Also, mind you, Qingdao in this bay is very foggy. Right? That's another problem that you know, during a certain time of the year, it's not usable because it's too foggy. Right? Heavy fog will sometimes stop the, the high, you know, highways and running. So you know, it's the actual usage per year. It's actually probably reduced. Some people calculate that. It was controversial. It was controversial. It took some time. But eventually, it was a goal, all right? It was a goal also because this person. This person's a party secretary was, a, you know, he served from 2000 to 2008, 2006, right? So he was a, a deputy party secretary, and then he, in 2008 and 2003, he became the party secretary number one in that, in that city. And of course, what happened in 2006, it was he was investigated, he was indicted, and last year, he was actually sentenced, life, life, life imprisonment for, for corruption, 
and bribery, and much of it is related to real estate development. Not, may not directly relate to that project, but the project was under his, his reign, if you will, under his rule, during his rule. And he was the one very much pushing it, behind it. It was, it was a debate. There are two debates right time, at that time. One debate is, is it worth it to build a bridge like that? which only cut about 30, 20 minutes, less than half an hour, right? It was not, there was no highway, there's a highway, it just turned a little bit turned, you know, a, a land-based land highway. Second debate is about whether it's a bridge makes sense or a tunnel, end sea tunnel makes sense, right? Which is, a tunnel obviously would not, you know, for both, uh, for transportation, uh, weather, safety, much, you know, a lot, some people argue that that may be the, uh, you know, even though it cost me a little more. Oh, by the way, the cost of that bridge is about 10 billion Chinese. 10 billion Chinese, 10 billion Chinese yuan. That's roughly about 3.7 um, um, uh, billion US. It's a lot of money. And not only that, the br building of it is only one kind of cost. The maintenance, you know, imagine the maintenance, of, you know, the annual maintenance. You know, no wonder there are a lot of companies, state-run companies, really ref tried to refuse to get the, man even get the rights to manage it. You know, they, because they don't want it. It doesn't make money. It does really make money in short term. 15 years, 20 years, it doesn't make money. Once, once you, you have run out and the operation and then, and then you ret return the rights to, to the government. But why that was built? Was built because the, this person. And this person, why? Because, but not only because him, but also because the local government. Leaders, this is a political here. In China, this is typical of what is called the sort of performance or political achievement projects, right? And there are many of such projects in China, right? Some people call it Gongcheng or the image projects. You know, city needs to have some major project to have the image. So no wonder all the cities in China, you go to all the cities, they're all big and larger, they drive for larger and faster, grander, more grander. It's all the big projects, right? I mean, if I'm, again, I'm an amateur, but I like to look at buildings. You know, one thing really would turn me off about this Kuhas building, I mean, this is my comment, it's not because it somehow has really interesting twists or something, it's great, you know, great design, but it's so grander, it's so out of place in Beijing, in that area. Even if it's such a, you know, CBD, a big, you know, a, a kind of functional uh, area for all the Chinese, uh, uh, Beijing's towers, that, that tower itself is so out of place, so grand, only in China. Really, only in China. There's no other place in the world, I bet you, that has such a grand buildings. You know, China, that's, again, there's another reason I'll come to discuss is government has the ownership of land. So they can do whatever at, at will. But now back to the point about this so-called political achievement or performance project. All right, so each, I, you, you, I actually did, uh, you know, in the last 10 years or sometime, I visited the city, visited the town, and so on. Every time I go to a place that I ask about buildings, the constructions, about project, they all say, such as this building, they point out the project, this building is so-and-so's Zhengji Gongcheng, sort of a mayor, some previous mayors or something. They all point it out. So all the citizens of that city, of that town, all knows about this kind of project. The question is why they do this sort of thing, right? And I think the answer lies in the political administrative system of China. That is, it's a, since 1980, Right? So instead of uh, you know, revolutionary cadres there who have no retirement age, you know, their evaluations purely from, uh, from, the, from above and the promotions that did not depend on the performance only because how red they are or they were and how committed they were to the revolutionary zeal, right? to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the ideals. Now, 1980 and since then, things have changed. Now they install something called performance evaluation system. Where it sounds very scientific, and they call it scientific management of cadres or officials. But that also built in, that, that you know, uh, 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 given all the advantage it has, it also has the built-in perverse incentive for local leaders to do short-term, right, grander, larger projects that only on the surface that could show that, you know, some sort of achievement. Right? That's why it's also called, sometimes called Xingxiang Gongzheng, image projects. And that's why also you go to Chinese cities, right? So you have these modern buildings, and modern, but guess what? Beijing City, there's a big problem. And sometimes it came out to the, to the fore. When it's, a, you know, when, it's down, when there was a downpour of rain, 
Be Beijing city would have, the, you know, the downtown would have a, a, a flash flood because the sewage system. Beijing does not, a lot of cities, I mean, Beijing did not have, no, none of the Chinese cities really have major, you know, a sewage system, like in many old European cities. Right? So what happened is that the sewage system is very difficult. It's underground, nobody to see, and when you dig it up, and then there's a lot of traffic, so on. So nobody wants, you know, leaders don't want to postpone that. They all claim that, oh, we'll deal with it, but they all postpone it. Why? Because it's not, you know, they'll pray there's no, flood, no, no, uh, no, no, no major downpour. But I tell you, Beijing City in the last 10 years had many of those flash floods, uh, you know, flash floods, precisely because the public sewage system is so bad, the public one, the major one. So why? Because all the leaders were driven to the pervert, by the perverse incentive to do the outside, the, the facade, you know, the look, the image. Right? So that, I think, is one of the major problems. But this guy, of course, got into trouble. But not, not because of this bridge, but because you know, he, obviously, some people uh, uh, exposed him to have engaged in a in, in number of scandals, including embezzlement, except, uh, uh, allegedly, except about 20 million, 20 million Chinese, uh, uh, Chinese yuan in, you know, in, 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 in bribe. So he was sentenced, obviously, by the Chinese uh, legal system to, uh, to, uh, to lifelong uh, life imprisonment, All right? So he was just example. I think he just he one example you know, in a major city, in a large city, that how a local leader, right, dri driven by this kind of uh, perverse, perverse incentive to do big project, he, that's only one project. This, this bridge has the image, I want to show you this bridge is only one. Right? But there are other images, uh, other, uh, other uh, uh, projects, for example, he also uh, uh, built some uh, uh, petrochemical companies in, uh, in that, despite the, the position uh, uh, from the local population. And so now that this kind of sort of a short term, you know, performance driven or image driven kind of a project has a problem. Why? Because then China has this, there's no planning. That's why an argument is all everybody's for its own term. Because that's important for, for his promotion, all right? His promotion or his uh, reward, you always have that kind of project. The problem that's left behind was tremendous, right? There are many reasons why China's, if you look at contemporary Chinese buildings, the average age is 20 to 30 years, right? And somebody, some architect, urban planner commented, I thought it was a very interesting comment. He said that China has a 5,000 years history written history, yet our average, the average history of our buildings are about 50 years. So is that a contrast? I think it's a very interesting comment about how shortage, the short li life, lifespan of, of Chinese buildings. So I give you some example, only give you some example of public buildings. There are also, uh, the shortest one, I, I, I sort of did some research, but really the shortest one about less than a year, not even a year, zero year. What well, those are the ones that violate the zoning, zoning law, and they built right along the river, I mean, uh, uh, Yangtze River. I mean, they were completely demolished. Those, you know, very good looking, very expensive uh, uh, residential. But those are private. That's not, let's not do that, right? Let's not even use those as example. Then would argue, where are the regulators, right? Where are the, you know, how could this, this builders, I mean, uh, developers you know, build the buildings to begin with, right? Without having less than a year, then they tore them down. Now, this one is uh, one example of how the short, you know, this is a, very, one of the large, what, 15, 18th floor story building. Is, you know, supposedly, when they try to demolish the building, it's so, so solid. The concrete is so hard to demolish, they put like 200, what, 250 kilos of uh, dynamite. And they could, you know, they had really studied, this is not easy building to demolish it, because the quality is so good. <laughs> but that's another interesting, it's not because of quality. Quality is not the problem. You know, the lifespan of a building in China is not because, no, there's, there's the problem with that, but this is not because of that. Many buildings not because of that. This is what, this is the last in about 20 years, right? So this is another, this building, because they want to, you know, uh, pave the way for other development. They sell the land to do other things. You know, come back to that point about land ownership, right? So this is, this is the, the image of, uh, of how this building uh, being blown, blown, you know, torn down. And, uh, you know, so the demol demolition professionally in China now have a heyday, you really now. Look at this, this is another one, this is a, a, a stadium. This is not a sad story. It's in Shenyang, the city of Shenyang. And this is called Wu He, uh, Wu, uh, Wu, uh, Wu, 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 Wu,
It's a very big stadium, a soccer stadium, and there's a lot of history to it. It was built, it opened 1989, right? In 1989, to, it was demolished in 2008 because Shenyang got the rights to have a, 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 a Olympic soccer game in there. So they felt this is not big enough, not fancy enough. Completely tore down and they built a new complex. Fancier, larger, you know, mod, mo, mo, modern building, a mo, modern stadium than this one. You know, this is another example of how there's no planning. And this is a tra another training in Wuhan, in the training, uh, the 10 years in the train, it's a training, a sports training center. Again, it's sort of a, this is all the images you can see. So this is small, second, third, or tertiary city called Yongchuan, you know, one of the old counties under, under Chongqing municipality. Five years, this is a sort of a, a kind of a conference and, and, and exhibition center, quite tall buildings, in that, the tallest building in that town, and they tore it down in five years. So I mean, this is all public, of course, or, or used to belong, to, at least belong, once belonged to the, to the government. And this is something called the Shenyang's Summer Palace. Uh, Xia Gong is actually a kind of a, a theme park. Again, this is about a few years, then less than 20 years. And this is not an interesting point. When I look at it online, this is not a sort of Shanghai people kind of reminiscent about this. This place is the so-called the, the best curve. They, they were, this, they built, uh, once there was, a, there was a highway leading, this is the old photo, leading from, uh, from out of town all the way to, to, to the Bong. And once the Bong, it's called Yan'an Lu, one of the major thoroughfare. And it's supposed to be beautifully designed. They wanted, you know, this obviously, but then because the new, the new plan, the new plan is to renovate the bond area, which I'm, I myself, I think it's good. It done a good job, but then there was no plan plan before, you know, ironically, and so they, they have tore, tore down this, this, this section, this section, and then build a new, completely tore, you know, tore it down, you know, demolish it, and then build a new one. So the point here is that I think it's here also gave you some sense about how could government so easily do things like this? Partly because China, again, uh, Professor uh, Mr. Jiang talked about uh, you know, the ownership of land, the Chinese public ownership. Now, I wouldn't use the public ownership. I would use government ownership because public ownership in this country referred to everybody has a stake. You know, in China, I think it's really the government owned it. Even constitutionally, it says state ownership. But that's state ownership that in theory, in constitution, actually translated into sort of a local government ownership, literally. And that's also because last 10 years, this is one, one, one thing I could, uh, I, could, I could cite as another incentive for this kind of short-term, faster, larger project. And that is because land becomes, in the last 10 years, major public finance revenue source. Land proceeds, right, land proceeds, the ones that you sell, auction the land, that proceeds accounts in some places, in some cities, counts over half, over half of the annual revenue of the local government. So that's how important selling land, auction land, right? Again, ironically, the land, when I say auction, it's not really sell. It's supposedly only long-term lease, 70 years. Because in China, there is not, still not, you know, private ownership of land. I mean, it was stress of land. Although developers would regard it as, you know, a, 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 a actual owner, actual usership, you know, actual long-term usership. But that's still, right? So government selling that, that ownership slash ownership, uh, uh, usership, and that proceeds, that proceeds, really those proceeds finance Chinese public projects. I'm not such a saying just this kind of project, but also services. That's why you see China's highways, if you go back 20 years, when China first built its you know, stretch of highway, China actually did not have money. The government did not have money. Right? In 1993, when, when, when the local, when Sichuan government tried to build the highway from Chengdu to Chongqing, right? they tried to build that in 1993. They caught that, that that construction cost riots, literally riots. I actually did research on that. Peasant riots in Renshou in 1993-94. The riot was because the government did not, they actually had three sources funding. Central government gave about one third, provided one third, right? Local government raised about, uh, provincial government raised about one third. 
then that last one third, the rest was raised, has to be raised by local, local governments, county, so on. Right? Whenever this, this stretch of highway passed, it's almost like almost like the fundraising to do to do highway. That's a quite interesting. Right? But that also caused problems because those are poor peasants. Where do you, you know, in the poor counties in, in between Sichuan in between Chongqing and Chengdu, that was a lot, there were a lot of poor farmers. Where do you get the money? That was, at that time, they could not sell land yet. They're not, or not because there was also, this is a rural county. So what do they do? They actually tax the local uh, peasants. That's why the taxation, the levies, because the, the buildings, that's 1990s. Today, peasants, that's a different story because local governments today are much richer, are much richer, partly because the land proceeds financing. So uh, my argument is that because this kind of institutional building incentive that local governments, for the one hand, I mean, on the one hand, they do a lot of good things. They provide public goods. They, you know, that's now what, that's why you see Chinese, you know, highways are, are first rate in, chi in, 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 the, in, in the world, right? But then there's, there's a huge cost behind it. Let me end quickly by make a quick comparison. Professor Jiang, uh, Mr. Jiang also want to compare. So I want to, it's all happened. I, want, I just came back from Czech Republic just for a conference. And I, whenever I go to the world, I always want to see the buildings. I, again, as a political scientist, but I'm fascinated by buildings. That's why I'm, I'm here third time, Jeffrey. <laughs> so this is the old town of Prague. It really is the town of Prague, right? This is, a, if you've been there, this is the town, town center from the town hall. You look in the you know, city. It's, it's really the, one of the most beautiful cities, but best preserved in Europe. And that building is the National Museum kind of a, what is it, Art Nouveau building, or there's a lot of Renaissance, just really almost like museum buildings, from Renaissance to, you know, to, uh, to Baroque, Baroque, and then to, to new, 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 uh, Art Nouveau, all the buildings. That one is a socialist realism. That, I was looking, the reason, I was looking as, as someone grew up in China at the socialist realism era, I was looking for, for that kind of buildings, but I see very few. The only two things that, I, one thing I noticed, this is right next to this building. It was just out of place. It was, used to be parliament. The end of the communists, Czech, Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. Now it's a library. It's a part of a branch of the National Museum as this one. Right, so that was probably built in 1960s or 50s and 60s, right? So I was, this is the reason, the reason why I will get images that I was thinking where the, I could not see the, the, the trace of communists regime. Then I ask the question, if you go to China, it's all about socialist or a communist era, right? About that era, or now and so on. But that was so well been reserved. This to this day, I'm always bemoaned the loss of the, the rampart, the city wall in Beijing. The, so Beijing, you know, I was like, how could they, you know, every old town I go to in the world, they all had the rampart. You know, the traffic could go under it and so on. When China, when Beijing built its subway, they tore down. The, the, the city wall. So anyway, but that's a different story. But the question I want to know, I want to ask is this. I don't think I have the answer, but why they're so easily, I mean, well, even under communists, in Czech, Czech communists, they actually did not touch the old city. What? They had no money. That's a very interesting question. So I want to discuss this a little bit. That, that is one reason. That is one reason. I mean, one reason that's probably also ownership matter too. I don't know if ownership, did they nationalize all the buildings? No, but the, all the buildings nationalized. I don't know. Maybe if they didn't. Maybe they didn't have money. Maybe that's a good news for the for the for the for the for the for, for the Czech Republic today. But they did build something. I have to add that the subway, the metro, the Prague metro. I was told build end of the socialist and the communist, and they, everybody seems to be very happy about that. And it was very nice. Anyway, so it's, it, there's some contrast. That is, socialism are different, as you point out, in different countries. Maybe there are something about the historical legacy of China that in their, in, in, in their thinking about what city should be or, or what, what, what ownership uh, in, in, you know, uh, uh, involves. So that is something I want to bring up and there may be a more discussion later. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Xiao uh, Xiao Bo. It, it's you're, you're sort of architect in spirit for sure. And anyway, again, thanks for for joining us uh, here. Uh, again, um, it's always a pleasure. And I do promise next time we will have more design to talk about. Okay. So um, 
And wait, it's an honor to introduce our next our next guest uh, in a certain way that they may not may not need much of an introduction. And so, in a certain way, to sort of limit the sort of introduction, I'll give both of them, both Doris and John Naisbit. I'll sort of do it in reverse because it, in a certain way, has to do with why uh, it's important to invite them to such an event. And one, it's particular interest to, to me is, is the sort of publishing of their book, Megatrends China, Eight Pillars of a New Society, uh, which, which again is, is um, an effort, at least for me, to understand uh, sort of the sort of issues within China, uh, the economy, politics, etc., from uh, a more Chinese perspective, um, against sort of the trend, at least uh, in this side of the world, to consider it uh, through the lens of, of Western kind of way of thinking um, and issues, again, about democracy, et cetera. So, so for me, uh, uh, being an American uh, and, and reading only uh, things in English, it's an important way to sort of comprehend maybe a new way of, um, of thinking about uh, China. Um, also, this is sort of, a, I, I guess, a, a, not really a follow-up, but it's also from the book Megatrends, which is also, again, was one of the New York Times bestsellers for uh, two years at least or something like that. Uh, which was again an important uh, a book, um, which which in a sense um, discussed sort of future trends, etc. Uh, in America, I think I believe. Um, but again, the, the the reason why we've invited him here here because it's it's been sort of their focus in the last uh, ten years, though their history in China has been for almost forty years. Uh, again, focus in uh, in China and their relationship there. Uh, in the founding of the Naisbeth uh, um, China Institute in 2007 in Tianjin. And I just quote from their website there, is it's to, to monitor and describe China's new social, economic, and political model and its implications for Chinese and foreign leadership. So again, I think through the successes uh, of, their, of their research, um, they found a, a sort of interested audience certainly in China and around the world, and how then these sort of ideas apply uh, to China. Um, and I'll just sort of give a brief, uh, again, biography for both, or introduction. Uh, and Doris, uh, Doris, amongst uh, being co-author of Megatrends China, is also the uh, author, co-author of China, the China Model, and author of uh, My Lin, My China. And she holds uh, professorships at Nankai and uh, Yunnan University and uh, Yunnan Normal Universities in China. Uh, and for John, uh, uh, again, he has uh, worked for both the, the Kennedy and Johnson uh, administrations and, and sort of the, the private sector for both IBM and Eastman, Eastman Kodak, has also been a consultant, I think, to most major international companies uh, around the, the world. Um, he is an advisor on agricultural development to the royal government of Thailand former visiting fellow at Harvard University, visiting professor at Moscow State University, faculty member at Nanjing University in China, distinguished international fellow, Institute of Strategic and International Studies in Malaysia, and the first non-Asian to hold this appointment, uh, professor at Nankai uh, University, Tian University of Finance and Economics, and, and the member of the advisory board of the Asia Business School in Tianjin, and a recipient of 15 honorary doctorates in humanities, technology, and science. Uh, and uh, the, the Naisbits live both in Vienna and in Tianjin, China. So again, a warm welcome, and thank you both for, for coming. We we'll have the lights. I'll see if we figure it out. Take it up. Yeah. Let's just... be light. <laughs> Please fill in your, your, your introduction where you feel necessary. Good evening. Uh, <clears throat> Doris and I uh, are very pleased to, uh, to be here because the question is, we're very interested in this question. Um, the question of the build environment, but it's so much larger than that as, as Jeffrey was uh, uh, suggesting. And uh, we, see, we see a kind of, in China, and, and we're now on the ground in China a lot, we spent, we just, we come to you from Cheng, uh, Chengdu, where we spent the last year, and we have a book coming out on, on Chengdu and what's going on locally, because one of the things, people mostly treat China as a monolith. China, for me, have, and I've been there going there 40 years, and I've been going all around the world, China for me is one, is the most decentralized, 
diversified countries in the world. You cannot understand China without getting on the, being on the ground and living in this city, going to this village. And that's what we've been doing for the last uh, uh, several years after our book, uh, our, our, our book on China first came out. Well, as you said, it's the most diverse uh, country in the world. Mike, uh, Mike do we have mics? I think uh, what we heard was a positive uh, view, or more positive view on China, and a quite skeptical view on China. And uh, we are just uh, about to start a column in a, in a German language newspaper. And we're going to begin this column by saying, all true, all wrong. Because you, looking at details, you can say many things, and they're all true, and they can be all wrong, depending on how you look at it. So you were quite right with uh, what you said, and you were right with what you said, depending on the view you have. And by picking and choosing, of course, you paint a certain picture. Well, in general, what we try to do is not to paint the picture we would like to see or a picture that's colored by our personal opinion, but move back and describe what we see going on on the ground. And that's what we did uh, in the last uh, year in Chengdu. And you know, uh, in this last uh, presentation, all the way through it, I was thinking, yeah, this is really interesting, I guess. Uh, about the built environment, a certain aspect, a pretty narrow aspect, I must say, about China. But I kept thinking about the people. You know, you can't understand a country without really getting a sense of the people. And you know, one of the things that we spend our time doing is talking to young people. We have literally uh, talked and, and, and had lectures and discussions with tens of thousands of young high school and, 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 uh, and, uh, uh, and university students uh, in, in all parts of China. And you know, to, 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 to experience these young students, to experience their almost euphoria about the, about the possibility of realizing their dreams, when, when, given what their parents were doing, what their grandparents were doing, given the personal freedom they have today. You know, I was thinking about that all the time. I saw those buildings go up and down, and I thought, yeah, that's part, that's part of the picture. But for us, it's the people. It's the 1.3 billion people. What is happening to the people? And their lives have been so vastly improved. And, it, and as Doris said, there are lots of there, there are things that are wrong, there are things that are right, and sorting them out is a big job. <laughs> but in sorting them out, we're kind of hanging on to what's happening to the people. Uh, we could now talk probably for three hours, just... Uh, uh, and will, and will. <laughs> <laughs> just reflecting on what uh, the both of you said. But as you said, the people and uh, China to, to make a connection. You know, when we were in Chengdu uh, about half a year ago, we, were, um, we went through a farmer's village. Uh, and uh, there was the party secretary uh, who took us through the village. And usually when you think of a party secretary in China, you have the image of a, of a, a stern-looking elderly man. Uh, but this was a very pretty, about 30-year-old woman. And it was exactly her appearance and you know, the image, the general image of a party secretary that made us come back to the town in which she is party secretary. And what we experience uh, is a local story uh, out, taken out of part of Chengdu, and it contradicts that there is no planning in China. This woman is a party secretary in a town of 38,000 people with an area of 34,000 square meters. And it was said before, you mentioned that Chengdu it's a city of 13, uh, 14 million, by the way, with uh, a population still about 50% rural. Now this woman uh, was the, the East uh, Party Secretary of Xinyi Village. Towns are called village even if they have 38,000 people. So uh, 
when she was appointed three years ago, it was a very backward uh, town. People were discontent. There was corruption, uh, and the prediction was, you will run away after three months crying. You will not stand it. What she did was she looked at the situation, she thought about it for about, and consulted with experts, uh, foreign and national experts, and after that time, she made a plan to turn the city into an ecological, organic city, green organic city. Now, of course, there's the question of how to get the money. Now, uh, Chengdu is very friendly to direct foreign investment. A Taiwanese company invested 300 million, uh, or was ready to invest 300 million uh, dollars US. into US <coughs> dollars into this uh, uh, area of the city, and what what happened? And that is a very complex situation, and we can't uh, uh, go into it uh, too much. But there's a lot of change because of the dualistic system in China. There's a two-class society between rural and urban population, which now is taken away in, in Chengdu. Also, as you said, uh, the uh, property uh, belongs to the country. So the, the farmers couldn't move uh, uh, with their property. They couldn't sell, they couldn't lease. But the city of Chengdu is changing that. So, Within that plan, the farmers decided to lease their land. At the same time, the city was giving them new land so that their plots could be put together. And they create, in this area, villages where the farmers live. And we, I wish we would have the computer here, then we could show pictures of that village, or those seven villages so far, uh, and the rest of the, uh, the uh, city is turned into an organic farmland. In order. Yeah. No, no, organic, yeah. Organic. Which feeds, of course, several, yeah. uh, several desires. The desire to have healthy food in China is rising. The middle class is rising who can afford that. And uh, the farmers have a job. They, they create their own, uh, what's it called, um, organizations to market the product and the Taiwanese company has its share too. So there are models on a very grand scale, relatively, to, to, to turn really a very poverty-stricken region into an economically... Uh, uh, and how many acres was that for organic farming? 54,000? Uh, I, don't, I don't remember Huge, the exact huge area. Number. This is a really a organic farming village is extraordinary, which was created bottom up. And there's so many things that are going on bottom up. Uh, in Chengdu, one, the reason we're in Chengdu, one of the reasons is that we, we totally understand, and everybody in China understands, that the largest problem by far, the overarching consideration in China, is the disparity in income and, and rights and all the rest of it between urban and rural. Uh, as far as we can tell, Chengdu, the city of 14 million people, half of them uh, 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 farmers, is doing probably as much as anybody, although there are initiatives all over, in integrating uh, urban and rural. That is their, and, and they've created a really interesting model, and we call it the Chengdu Triangle. And the Chengdu Triangle has on one side a reform of property rights. And on, on, on another uh, leg, it, it has uh, equalization of public services, including education, health, and so forth. And on the other leg, or side of the triangle, grassroots democracy. And their mantra in Chengdu is grassroots democracy in the election. This, this young woman, uh, <clears throat> uh, was, she was appointed party secretary but now they have elections in the villages and the townships, and she was elected to, to her, her job. And we've been to some of these elections where the campaigns and, and the people make speeches and vote for me and so on. It's a little awkward because it's a new kind of thing. But grassroots democracy is, is one of the, one of the legs of, of this Chengdu triangle 
which is an extraordinary, but it is extraordinary, but it's not that it's only happening in Chengdu. It's happening at different degrees in various places, but we think in Chengdu it's, it's advanced as far as, we, as we've been able to find. And for those who might not be so familiar with China, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk of urbanization of China. Uh, uh, China is uh, uh, urbanizing rapidly, but together, uh, with the urbanization, you have to solve the dual system that uh, did not give the rural population access, as John just said, to the same rights as the, uh, the uh, urban population. Uh, if a farmer would work in the city, his children could not go to the school in the city without paying fees he couldn't afford. If he would be sick, he couldn't get the treatments that people of the cities, uh, city would get. So uh, that's why uh, it was so important, and that model to us is very impressive in regards to a sustainable uh, economic growth, that if, if they wouldn't work on all three aspects, then the progress <coughs> could not be made or it wouldn't be sustainable. Well, what's so interesting is, you know, the, the mantra from ever, for everyone is innovation and so on, but innovation, certainly in the West, is done in a very compartmentalized way. In the West, innovation means uh, innovation in business and technology. But when you're creating a whole new society and a whole new system, innovation is in the social side, in education and so forth. And what they've done in Chengdu is to integrate all this integration. Uh, innovation, to integrate the innovation so they feed off one another and, and nourish one another for, for the new things they're developing. And to end, are we, you got something else? No, no, go, go okay. ahead. Uh, to we want to uh, answer many questions. Because we'd like to answer questions. Uh, to end, I would say, you know, China has one big advantage in, in developing sustainability, in innovation, and in all these things. That advantage is China is a country with no ideology. China is a country that's the most practical of, of, of ground I have ever seen. Uh, and this was all launched by Deng Xiaoping, of course. Deng Xiaoping was not a poet. He was not an ideologue. He was probably <laughs> one of the world's greatest pragmatists. And trial and error, the whole country of China for, for many years now has become a, a, lab, a laboratory of, of trying out things, uh, discarding things that don't work, and then embracing things that do work and, and spreading many of them uh, nationwide. So Chengdu is, uh, is, one, is one of the most active uh, uh, places in China. Some places in China are dead in the water. Nothing is happening. Other places, you know, things are bubbling all over the place, or, or maybe a little bit. In Chengdu, in the west, right in the heart of China, is uh, Chengdu is, is a great uh, city of innovation, a great city that, of, of sustainability, and they call themselves a garden city. Now, we couldn't figure that out at first, uh, but we saw trees on every side of every street, uh, trees on the islands of the highways, trees and plants and flowers all over. But, you know, there was something more there. And what we discovered was it's kind of a mindset, Garden City. It's, it's, it's a, we want a city where we're experiencing our city as a modern city, but we're experiencing our city as a garden, a garden with, with flowers and plants and parks. They build parks left and right all over the place. Uh, it's, it's really an extraordinary thing. So we want to put that story of Chengdu alongside of some of the things you've heard uh, uh, earlier this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to introduce our final speaker, um, who is actually an architect well, and designs yeah. uh, you know, uh, buildings. And um, uh, he's uh, Xie Ying Chung. He uh, graduated from uh, Tamkan University in 1977. Um, and uh, following a massive earthquake in Taiwan in 1999, 
He took his office to the Sun Moon Lake disaster area in Nantu County, where, with its high population of Aboriginal Tao minor, minority, to begin reconstruction efforts. Uh, guided by simple tools and environmentally friendly materials, he was able to complete reconstruction uh, with uh, extremely tight economic parameters. He continued this kind of work in uh, 2008, the earthquake in Sichuan. Uh, he managed to set up his studio called Rural Architecture Studio there to reconstruct homes for disaster victims in isolated mo mountain areas. Uh, and then in 2009, uh, when there was a typhoon in Taiwan's mountainous um, areas, he uh, again uh, worked with a number of uh, organizations to rebuild uh, tribal buildings and work toward permanent uh, housing for them. So uh, he um, is somebody who works very much with local materials, low cost building strategies and appropriate technologies. Um, uh, so, uh, which I think is a considerable feat in, in this context. So we're very honored to have you um, come and talk to us. Please welcome. Um, our next speaker. Thank you. I just, I just want to also introduce Jenny Chow, who's a graduate here from Columbia, who will actually help with the uh, uh, translation. And you work together, right? I'm going to talk about the construction of the village. For the first time, the construction of the village has been built 是城市的四倍，那大家都很对对中国的城市建设非常吃惊它的数量跟它的速度，但是农村近悄悄的盖了四倍的这量，然后这些建筑物呢，基本上我们的建筑专业者是没有办法进到这个领域去的。Um, we will start talking about um buildings in rural village in China, which has built four times more four times of square footage than um, in the urban area. And this is an area that uh, usually a professional practitioner hasn't been able to penetrate. 那雖然說我們的工作很多是災區的工作,但事實上災區的工作並不是解決災區的問題,而是過去的積累,甚至於說那是大部分農村建築的問題. Although most of our work um, involved with post disaster reconstruction, but what the real problem we had to face in uh, reconstruction work is not immediate rebuild, but it's the problem that accumulated from the history. As we know, this is the Rastash in Berlin, a very high end sustainable building. Uh, 市民可以在这边可以监督国会的议员他的一举一动 The design team tried to uh, make the government process apparent to the public and adding a social element 我再举一另外一个例子,这是在非洲的,同样是部落里头的议事厅 There's a different um, example, this is in Africa, this is um, a tribal um, assembling um, hall 注意一下,他的房子里边都是大石头。那右边那个人是坐在那边,基本上人坐在里边的话,脚都夹在那个石头缝里头。So this is built by a really large piece of stone. When you sit in there, you are restricted. Your body are restricted in between. 房子非常矮,你要站起来也是很困难。It's also very low, so it's difficult to stand up. 因为开会要吵架,这个房子的话可以 this is to prevent physical fighting during the meeting. And this is a of course, this is a very uh, ecological, sustainable building, as well expressed artistically. This is what we want to express. the so this is the um, key point of our uh, talk today, how um, building in real village can combine um, social aspects and also uh, incorporate with the local intelligence and knowledge. 
，呃，按照 C I B 的的规范，哈、哦，来定义这个呃，我们今天讲的这个所谓的可持续的建筑，因为可持续建筑的呃定义方式是非常多的。The raw range of、um, definition for sustainability, and we will roughly base ours on the C B I structure. C I B, sorry. 呃，它含包含了三个内涵哈，就是关于经济方面的，呃，环境方面的，还有经济方面的，另外就是社会文化。So、including environmental quality, economic constraint, social quality, and cultural issues. 我们按照这个三个三个主题，我们讲我们的对应的方法。And we will、um, talk about our project、uh, in accordance to、um, the three category. 呃，如何做到这件事情？好，这是我们的策略。好，专业者应该要做什么事情 ？And how we do it, and what do, what's the、um, service that we provide？ 那我们是希望说，呃，居民、社区的居民能够参与到我们的工作来。The important element is、um, the community participation in our work。先从那个关于环境的这个议题上讲起。我们强调的就是绿色建筑，哈。We start with、uh, environmental, environmental quality. What is green building? Uh, What's important is the appropriate technology and local wisdom. Uh, we will talk about the number of 呃，这个两层楼的一个砖房，也就是我们现在盖的房子，跟这个砖房，我们现在看到最普遍的这个房子，它之间的差距能够减排多少 ？We talk about、um, this calculation of how to reduce carbon emission, and、um, it's what you um, um, calculate against this is a typical two-story brick building. 呃，适用技术，我们这是一个项目，就是我们怎么样。用很简单的方式来创造高效率的那个呃的的隔那个绝缘的那个高需要力的节能窗。那 how we use really simple material but create high efficiency um insulation。我们用用那个发泡的胶带做隔隔绝，用 PET 膜夹在夹在两层玻璃当中。How we use um uh this um Foam glue and put on PET film in between to create on the air insulation space. 那中间夹上草跟剪纸。And、um, between the air space is the paper cutting and also some、um, like like grass on inlays. 这样子的话，我们可以创造高效率。它有两个空气空气层或者三个空气层。那这个是这样做的话是很便宜，而且我们把传统的工艺可以窗花可以放在那个窗子里头。This can create on、um, two to three um insulation air space, and we can incorporate like a、uh, local crafts technique in the window. 这个花费大概只有我们一般这个这种窗子二十分之一的费用。This will cost um only twenty percent how a、uh, normal a、uh, high insulation window will cost. 还有很多的。当地的的技术改良以后的，像这个是用竹子加强的楼板。This is、um, we use um bamboo bamboo as flooring。还有很多像竹子夹上这个这个绝缘层的做法。Incorporation of bamboo as wall elements with on、um, the insulation layer。哦，做起来的房子这样。还有就是利用很多当地的技术、当地的材料，结合起来，呈现出多样化的一个样貌。The most of the time, we source the material locally. Um, in result, very um diverse. 很多不同的做法。这个是一个比较特别的，就是用农民熟悉的那个温棚的架子组合成的一个一个一个一个礼堂。This is a special case where we use the、um, greenhouse structure that you see、um, all over the rural village, and we、um, reuse the structure and make the、uh, eco assembly hall for the village.
非常便宜的一个造价，然后效果非常好，不要采暖啊。So so very low budget and as well um insulated. 我们现在谈一下关于那个呃经济的问题。And we talk about the economic constraint. 呃，我们很强调就是怎么样建立社区的呃自主的一个营建体系。We put a lot of emphasis on how to um organize this community. 然后他投入的资金可以非常少。So we we need um very little funding. This is uh uh we in Taiwan East Baba Water after the dam was built a plant. That the annual production can be two thousand five hundred tons of chlorine. This is our factory um for the um two thousand nine um typhoon Marco reconstruction um. In this factory, we can produce two uh, two thousand units per year. 那这用的设备都很简单，呃，村民他们都可以操作。We use a uh, relatively very simple machinery, and all like local um commoner villager can operate. 那一般来讲，如果要做这种生产轻钢的生产工厂的话，你可能要投资几千万、上亿的资金，但是这个东西只要几十万就可以做。Normally, if you need to um put have a um, like with steel manufacture factory, it will cost um, millions of dollars, but this one um, costs us about um, just tens of thousands. Uh, I have to emphasize that the local workers have to be able to We talk about the process of this um, cooperative and exchange labor work. That is to say, for the money, the so-called exchange rate can be lowered to the lowest. So we can have lesser dependence on on the finance. So they don't need to build the tents in the Wall Street. Uh, 按照这种方式的话，可以把房子的造使用的货币，我们讲使用的货币降到只有百分之三十，一般建房的费用的三十。We can reduce to thirty percent of regular construction costs. Uh, 再讲。关于社会文化的这个、这个、这个、这个、这个课题。The next is on social equality and cultural issues. 呃，我们让要让村民能够参与，我们必须把所有的构造简化。In order for the um villager to participate in this construction process, we have to simplify the construction. 这也牵涉到所谓的工作权的问题。This is also related to um like the working rights. 呃，呃，例如我们我们成立的这个施工队，到现在大概有五十几位哈、哦，跟我们做了十几年。那他们基他们基本上都是村子里头认为是没有用的人。For example, we have about fifty workers that have been working with with us since on the the Samu Lake reconstruction in '99, and those people were used to be considered um not helpful in the village. 呃，跟传统的这个、这个、这个文化跟技术的结合。And how we combine um modernization and traditional technique. 左手边这个是我们我们的呃设计的这个钢架，右手边那个是呃传统的穿斗式的一个屋架。On the left side is the open lightweight steel structure system that we have invent. And the right side is the traditional wood column and tie system. Its construction principles are the same, so the villagers can easily use it. Uh, the structural logic is the same, so it's easy for the villager to um put it together. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. Oh, this is our design design for the building. 然后就是强调的，就是它能够跟当地的文化结合，它能够呈现出多样化的一种像样貌。Now, when our open system combined with um local resources and in our um diversities， 跟传统的工艺也可以结合。And incorporate with the traditional um technique。我们再讲一下我们专业者怎么做这件事情。这有一个概念，刚才提到的，专业者是。
从来没有踏入这个大部分农民的建房的的这个领域。那专业者怎么进到这个领域，让他的专业能够发挥？哦，那这是一个一个很重要的一个一个一个方法。And that's we talk about what should we do as、um, the professional and how we can、um, penetrate, enter through this、um, most of the dwelling system, the dwelling, the issues question, the issue with regard to、um, habitation and dwelling. 也就是专业者只能做少量而必要的事情。Which means like we can only do what is the most、um, essential elements. 大部分的要交给农民，交给。The rest has to、um, depend on the user and the villager to involve in the process. 第一个我们讲的就是我们要建立一个开放的体系。We have to establish an open system. 第二个就是我们要简化这个所有的这个构法。And second is we have to simplify the construction system. 呃，这是一个案例，就是我们左手边这边是一个开放式的一个架构。它可以跟各种的材料能够结合。Because we have an open structure system, it can work with any different types of different material. 跟传统的工艺也可以结合。And with traditional technology. 而且它有弹性。And flexibility. 这是我们在呃呃四川的北面的灾区的重建的一个项目。它第一年它的资金不够，它就住住在呃盖盖好一楼。This is a project that we did in north northern Sichuan during the earthquake reconstruction.、Um, this house can be、um, re rebuilt incrementally. So the first year they only have money to build the first level, and they can move in and they can finish the house as they have more funding. We now all of the building system is impossible to do this. Which is unlike most regular、um, construction process. 呃，第二个讲我们关于这个简化构法哈、哦。And how we simplify this construction？ 因为所有的构造方式其实都是新的。Um, all the constr all the um construction methods are new。所以必须要让它简化以后，他们才能够上手可以做。So it has to simplify so the um、uh, participant can be able to um participate in this process. 我们我们强调的就是协力互助、村民互助的的这个造物的方式。你没有这个条件，他是没有办法做的。Without this、um, cooperative self-built construction, we cannot、um, achieve the reconstruction. 呃，接下来我很快的讲一下我们呃曾经做过的项目哈。那这个是在台湾，呃，我们第一个项目，它是一个呃少数民族的一个一个部落，它不只是。一个提供他一个呃呃居所，另外很重要的就是文化保存。So we'll go through a few projects that we have worked on. This one is、um, the Ida Thao reconstruction at the Samu Lake after the、uh, 921 earthquake in Taiwan. What was important in this village is not only to、um, reconstruct a home for them, but we have to preserve、um, their culture. 他他这个族群。保持的传统祭典文化是非常丰富的，所以这个这个社区是按照它传统文化的那个空间来建构。This tribe is noted for、um, the preservation of its、um, culture and ritual, so especially、um, this village was organized according to、um, its traditional ritual needs. 还有很多的个别家屋哈，地震以后的重建。And independent independent houses after reconstruction. These are all used by local materials and very simple tools. This is very little budget and use、so、very low budget and use、um, local resources. And the community buildings. This、um, local community classroom. Also, the village people do it. It's all、um, involved the participation of the、um, community. 呃，另外一个就是尿粪分离厕所，我们在农村里头呃推动的这个尿粪分离厕所，这是非常重要的。An、important project that we do is、um, the urine and feces separation toilet in the rural village. 呃，就是它可以不用水，然后能够很快的呃这个无害化，能够对呃
Once and do it. Um, it doesn't is a waste water. Is no water is required here, and it can decompose quickly. Its principle is very simple. It's very simple. Just to separate the urine and the feces. The earth is too big. And it's worse. 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 Worse.
，最重要的观点就是说，捐助是有限的。那这个是呃呃呃捐助的一个部分，其他部分旁边它都可以延展，可以扩充。What an important concept is um donation. The donation or um funding is limited, but because this open system that、uh, we are working with, um, is possible for future expansion. 哎，这个项目比较特别，就是因为它的呃交通运输比较困难，所以除了钢架以外，跟跟屋顶还有一些少部分材料以外，大部分都是当地的的土做成土袋填到墙里头。This is an emergency shelter project, which um is um special because it's located very um in the in the mountain, the deep mountain, where transportation is difficult, and we bought in the lightweight steel and roofing material and、yeah. use. Um, local material and the wall is、um, filled with、um, clay. Where、um, like、vegetation will grow on the wall in the future. And this is a Tibetan herdman's house. It has to deal with earthquake resistance, transportation, and quality control. Especially extreme climate condition. 哦，我们就在传统的土房子里头设计了一套抗震的钢架。We um within a a traditional um adobe wall a structure we insert a earth res res I mean earthquake resistant and lightweight steel structure. 然后它的传统的工艺也可以保存。Can um preserve the traditional technique. 呃，他们可以自己做。It was built by the、um, villager. That this type of system, to system, to do is very difficult. Um, it's quite the system is actually quite simple, so it's actually very difficult to make a mistake. So, uh, equipment problem is very easy. So, um, the quality control issue is not difficult. That this house can be reduced to 40 tons per unit because the house is very small. It can reduce、um, carbon emission of 14 tons. 14 tons. 这个我想大家都了解的这个这个原则哈，这是我们呃始终坚持的，而且试图的去做到的一个大家知道的原则。I'm sure you all know these、um, ten key values, and those are values that、um, we try to、um, follow and realize. 谢谢各位。Thank you. So why don't we just uh, um, being sort of at the table, and we have a sort of brief discussion. <laughs> no, wait, wait, you should sit.、Um, I, I will just stand here. It's getting late, but、um, we would really like to give you the opportunity to have even a brief discussion.、Um, I think we heard really fascinating、um, presentations um, that,、uh, you know, with a big range from the sort of、uh, large modernization projects、uh, and sort of thoughts about them and the shifting political structures. Uh, alongside uh, th that are that are、um, happening,、uh, perhaps as a result of these large、uh, urbanization processes,、um, and on the other hand,、uh, a smaller, perhaps more humanistic approach to、uh, modernization that is emerging with、uh, the work that we just saw.、Uh, and I mean, I'm struck by these sort of、um, contrasts, the two poles. Uh, that we saw illustrated, and I wonder if, just as a start to the discussion, perhaps our speakers might want to、um, discuss with each other. Uh, perhaps uh, Professor Liu,、uh, if you have some responses. No, I, I, I just want to say that I'd rather have millions of those、uh, nice houses, new houses in the countryside, than one bridge. Really, because I think it's so important to have. I mean,、uh, Dr. Mr. Shear's efforts. I was so impressed. I mean, also, 
One of the things I would <coughs> ask is that uh, I'm impressed especially by the idea of using more primitive materials. You know, there is something about using bricks in China. The masonry bricks is very widely regarded historically as the must. But bricks, one thing is making the material cost you know, emission, and itself, it's not. It's also very, you know, as we know, it, 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 you know, I, I grew up in northern China. I see when I, you know, when I drive, uh, when I drive uh, uh, on a bus uh, going through the uh, uh, northern China, uh, 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 you know, um, flatland, you see a lot of big holes in the land in Hebei area, and I'm always curious where that, you know, when I was young, I said, why is that? That's the dirt they dig up to wow. to make a thousand years to make bricks. So this is interesting that they back to the earth, back to using just mat simple materials, and which is better? I think that's that's a wonderful idea. And uh, I would also ask. I thought the bricks was now Chinese has planned to, had a plan to ban the use of bricks, the masonry bricks. And uh, what's happened with that? I, I thought was it? Uh, I read it some years ago that they're not going to use the traditional brick. The masonry brick, because you know it's some, they have some. I don't know, it's material wise, it's very. I just say, "Zhuan." They use zhuan. I actually, in Chinese technique, is very bad. I think it's very difficult. It takes a long time. Some times, I think the most strange thing is that in many places, you can use zhuan. It's very strange. 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 It's very it's, it's something about the Chinese uh, construction culture mm. traditionally that using bricks is something, anyway. So they're changing the culture as well in some ways, for that I think. So I just say, you are some cultural things that you are changing the language, right? 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 是把那个有机质的烧死，哦，千百年来，把那个土全部烧成砖的话，那有机质是烧掉了。有机质土是非常珍贵的。So the process of uh, making the bricks actually is um, you killing all the uh, uh, the organism in the clay itself. 那其实中国政府在。已经几十年来强强力的禁止用砖，但是很难找到其他的替代。当然是现在有很多的水泥砌块各方面做，但是真的在农村里头，它还是没有办法禁止。Although the Chinese government has tried to、um, limit and ban the use of bricks in rural village, but it's still very difficult for the villager to find replacement. 那我们基本上是提供了这个解决的方法。那另外就是，如果是有过去的砖的话，它会回收可以使用。So we try to offer alternatives to、um, this problem, and also try to can recycle the old bricks. You know,、uh, to build a bridge between your bridge and、uh, the, the houses <laughs> <laughs> you were showing,、um, uh, maybe you were also、uh, doing some of the、uh, villages that we were seeing in Greater Chengdu. Where the earthquake has struck, uh, struck in Sichuan. He plays in Chengdu, actually. Yeah, that's yes, what I concluded uh, yeah. by uh, talking about. I know, I know you. Oh. Were a project. Oh. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good. Uh, you, you know what? What I what we believe really stands behind it, and there is a change in thinking that we see in the Chinese society from the uh, um, uh, community-driven. Uh, collective uh, thinking to the individual thinking. The respect for the individual is rising. And that is all standing behind creating better conditions, including much more agreeable houses, and turning such a tragedy uh, like the earthquake in, in Chengdu into an opportunity to give people better living conditions. I actually have a, a question, a, a comment about that. When you mentioned that, actually, I, you know, again, I'm more of a, uh, of a, a doubter of this inorganic organization effort to build a new village, because I think there's a failure in the past. But you're mm -hmm. saying that, that this is related to uh, Mr. Xie's effort, too. So after disaster, this kind of seemingly inorganic 
organization, you know, trying to create a new village, if you will, actually can be quite successful. That using his method, well, that building a new village using, because you said organic <laughs> farming. I was thinking that's so ironic because you organically create organic farming. But opportunity in crisis, that's the Chinese idea. Right? So <laughs> Fade, 这个这个势头跟想法是相左，所以它还是有相当的困难。So you know, sorry, actually quite special, and um, it's going against the uh, um, development, the modernization development trend. So it's um, it's actually quite difficult for us to try to um, promote and realize. Yeah, I, th I think he actually pointed out an irony here. That is in the modern in the modernizing society, the desire to be modern, to have modernity, understanding is different from the postmodern societies. What the effort of going back to the primitive use of mud and adobe is actually postmodern. Let's let's face it, it's not modern because that's why it's very difficult for the modernizing villagers to say this is better than than a steel, concrete, and brick structure, right? So what you saw change, right? Yeah, you mentioned, uh, uh, we said before, you know, it's all right and, and wrong at the same time. Uh, uh, you're absolutely right. This uh, top-down decision-making of you live here, you live there, you get a new village and you move out of your yep. Uh, yep. environment was a disaster yep. because it uh, uh, didn't uh, respect the rights of the farmers and it uh, uh, tore them out of their environment without giving, allowing them to take roots in another environment. And that's why we think that the only way to really uh, solve that is to work simultaneously on all the problems that are linked to that. Uh, uh, if they don't have the right to decide what they do with their land, they can't make money with their land. If they don't have, can, if, if farmers can't uh, get roots in the urban area, uh, you know, they are without uh, rights, they can't uh, uh, settle there. And if they don't have a right to vote, to decide what do we do, then they can't relate to what's happening. I'm wondering, uh, maybe I'll have one more question to jump to you and then we can maybe open up some questions to the floor. But I'm wondering now how to relate sort of some of your presentation back to sort of this notion of the new socialism or the potential, not only the potential, let's say, uh, if, if we think about uh, the role uh, of the government within notions of sustainability, and if we talk about these sort of social experiments, right, and so there's a whole history of social experiments in China, right, and the ability for the, the single party to actually make, you know, a difference and change, uh, and how that sort of actually uh, plays itself out when there's also um, sort of the desire and the necessity to sort of involve uh, grassroots or sort of public community involvement in those systems. So, and I think you write about a little bit in your book too. It's like, so where do these sort of things uh, meet exactly when we have, and I think tonight we've seen the full spectrum of that sort of condition. And maybe in this new socialism, there is an opportunity to find where voices are heard both the potential from the top down, decision making, but also from the bottom up. Yeah, yeah, in the end of my talk, I talk about dynamic planning, and the dynamic means that uh, when when there is a, a kind of new movement coming up, uh, especially when this movement is uh, kind of defining the future trends, especially uh, in China, this future trend shows there's a, always a, a tension between the state and society. 
and, uh, and then there is a kind of planning to uh, give a direction to this trend. So, for example, I'm, I'm, I'm also quite familiar with what she did in China and uh, 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 his activities in uh, local society actually shows a, a kind of uh, rural tradition in the uh, agricultural civilization of China uh, in which the intellectuals uh, uh, whenever he is uh, adapted by the state government or maybe uh, rejected by the state government and come back to the rural society, he always plays a role uh, in the social organization in a positive way. I mean, but sometimes you can also find bad or uh, negative cases that intellectuals <coughs> has become very corrupted. But somehow, because of the grassrooted way, um, the social and grassrooted society can be organized. And, but uh, uh, it's, this is also a quite updated condition because we are now in uh, industrial time. Uh, industrial time is that uh, actually everything is not connected in the, into a big circle and, and, uh, and the peasants and even ourselves, including ourselves, are uh, farther, farther and farther away from the food production or the earth and, and we are just part of a bigger macro circle. However, uh, the uh, intellectual involving themselves into the rural society means that uh, it, it is possible to uh, give these embedders of intellectual um, by means of uh, craftsmen and by, by means of other uh, creatorships. Uh, I know somebody who is also going back to the, to the countryside to relink the people to the earth. <coughs> and, uh, uh, and so uh, the states, when the states knows or notice these this uh, trends, uh, there could be some action, dynamic action. So uh, I know from 2003 to 2006, the rural tax uh, that was lasted for over thousands of years was uh, abolished, mm -hmm. and uh, the uh, government even started to uh, give subsidies to the uh, rural countryside. And then also what you talk about, about grassroots democracy is also now uh, being uh, experimented in some places. And the, the land coupon system is also part of not only Chengdu, but also Chongqing. And uh, I, I think this is kind of dynamic, uh, dynamic uh, planning going on. And uh, because I'm come up from a media background, so media is also somewhere uh, that state and society can meet each other. Uh, previously, Media was quite monopolized by the state, and everything is very strictly censored. But uh, now it's also uh, kind of privatized. I mean, the usership or management of the media is given to the private firms. However, it's still strictly, very strictly censored because the, the ownership of the media is still public, so-called public. But I want to respond later about what is public in China because I, I still think there is public. And then uh, there is a, a, a kind of bottom line. But this bottom line is vigor, uh, much, much bigger than before, so that we can still p play games inside, not uh, directly criticize to some very sensitive issues, but we can uh, actually go on around to make this more rational. So I think good media can do that. And this is more flexible, we have to be honest to that. And about the public asset, it's also, it's also one of, uh, is something that public and the private can meet because uh, the pu public ownership in China is uh, divided into uh, the state-owned land in the urban areas and uh, uh, the collective-owned land in the rural areas. Uh, however, this tradition in the traditional, I mean traditional or fundamental socialism time, especially in Mao's time, is quite strict. But uh, in those times, there are some failures. I admit a lot, a lot of failures because uh, what he talked about, uh, a Lu talked about, is also about one of the failures about the corruption and the monumental act of the local go uh, government. But there are a lot of complicated issues uh, behind that, not only uh, this kind of uh, <coughs> uh, corrupted uh, governmental issues. And um, what I'm talking about. And then the uh, public and the private issue is in this situation. Uh, the Chongqing experience or Chengdu experience actually shows that the, there's still a possibility of public asset can, um, can be a benefiting issue of the local society. Because the uh, government, because they have the land, 
And then they can combine the land usage together with master planning, and they uh, specialize their business into some core resource uh, uh, business, for example, infrastructure, just as you said. And then this infrastructure, of course, if well managed, because uh, part of our job as urban planners is actually to optimize the selection of the location and the design of all these, or planning and design of all these spaces. And then together with master plan and state on the land, the uh, state on the land can be optimized in, into the best values. And then uh, there is a, also old idea about the state on the land benefit all the society. Uh, but one of the failures of the Chinese system, of the housing system, is that uh, individuals actually get benefited a lot from the increment. And there are so many uh, billionaires, millionaires, billionaires because of that, because they are uh, speculation into the housing system. But this is also being reformed. And then on the other hand, when uh, there's alternative financial income uh, from the state-owned assets, the entrepreneur's taxes is going down. And then you actually, this is kind of win-win model. It's not like zero win model. Uh, government win and the entrepreneurs will lose. But this is not a general model yet. Uh, this is still in Chongqing or in Chengdu, but not necessarily in other places. As you said, it's quite diversity <coughs> and being experimented. So the whole process is going on. And uh, I think the, the situation uh, have to be very uh, complicated. But we have to know the principle. Where is the, our ultimate role, our ultimate destination? And no, uh, although we're going to make a lot of mistakes, but uh, actually we're, we're not uh, going to stop this direction because of mistakes. Because we can correct the mistake uh, if we believe in this direction. So that's, that's actually one of my beliefs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Uh, yes, in the back. Uh, thank you. I'm quite tired, so I drifted in and out of the uh, presentations. Uh, I've had sleep in about three days. And so, but as the images came into my mind's eye in the last visual, I didn't know, I can't remember which uh, presentation. It, it looked like a very, we, we were talking about natural. Uh, ingredients for housing and, and images all look quite rural and, and idyllic in, in the countryside. Uh, contrastingly, it, uh, I, I do a lot of reading and visual reading, particularly newspapers, and what comes to mind is three articles in the last three weeks. One, there was an article in the London Financial Times of approximately a third of a page in which there was a, um, a real estate uh, conference in Beijing or Shanghai and the point of the article was is that the people who had made money in the first uh, property speculation, in, in the first cycle pro pro uh, property speculation, which is slightly coming to an end right now because, as you know, China is trying to bring its uh, inflation down, uh, were looking to buy uh, property abroad because they could move large sums of money out of the country and get out of the country now. And the point of the article was is that those who had speculated in the first property boom uh, thought, quote in a quote, that the environmental uh, evolution of China was going in the wrong direction, and they wanted to get out. So I'd like you to address that if you've heard or seen any of that. The second point is, is that <clears throat> one of the interesting newspapers in the country here is a, and I find it very good journalism, even though it has obviously an objective, is a newspaper called the Epoch Times, which is put out by the Falun Gong. And it's a free newspaper right around here in New York City. And uh, uh, last week, they had a front page article in which they say that something like 60% to 75% of the farmland in China was contaminated like brown fields. So the point of the matter is that, is that just propaganda in the Falun Gong trying to do something? Or what merit does that have in terms of the uh, pollution of the farmland? Which brings up the gentleman in the middle discussion of mo modernity. And as I was listening to that, I could not help but think that as I looked at these rural images there, above all of that are these mega cities. And in this mental general quest for moder modernity, um, we have uh, the move into the Industrial Revolution uh, in which we are, not we, China, is following the way of the British in the United States and producing these mega cities in obsolete methods. So here we have in the rural area attempt to be simple jump over the modernity, and then, but overall, we have this 7% uh, uh, growth pattern 
in which we're making these mega cities. And, and in essence, we also know of another article where they're having uh, uh, riots in towns because this move to modernity is polluting the rivers, et cetera, et cetera. So one, why are they saying is it just propaganda that people are trying to get out of the cities or get out of the country because the country is generally going in the wrong direction? Mm -hmm. Two, is it true or not that the farmland in brownfields is significantly uh, polluted? Right. Three, is it necessary to really have China look totally at the production of pollutants, et cetera, et cetera, and try to adapt overall a concept of simplicity, if not uh, the International Energy Agency came out with a report last week saying that we got about three more years and it's really quite over, you know. So would you please generally address uh, is the overall atmosphere in China reaching a point where the populace is getting quite upset and uh, you need to do something about the general pollution. Thank you very much. I can't help to, to point out, you, you're really an avid reader of, uh, of newspapers and, and all three. Uh, no, I mean, this is our, I mean, uh, no joke, those are very important questions you raised. I mean, the easiest one to answer is number two. Epic Times, I don't trust every word they say. Okay. All right, no, no, but, but it's a, is the pollution problem serious in the countryside? Yes. But, you know, I don't know that 60%, how did they get to know that part? I mean, I had that doubt. I mean, would John and Doris tell you that China is so vast? I mean, if you look at small locale, yes, there are some problems of uh, pollution. But I doubt that 60% of the farmland all polluted. I mean, yeah, I, yeah I mean, there's a thousand years of using, uh, you know, organic or non-organic. They may, may, may cause, but how polluted and what is the pollution that, re, you know, using that, that's, I don't know. The, Harder question are the other two. The first one is why the Chinese, is it true that Chinese rich are trying to get out of there? The answer is yes. There are this recent phenomena, which I'm studying and I'm teaching a course on Chinese politics. We're trying to still figure that out, why that is the case. There is this interesting development in the last couple of years that indeed some of, new, some of those who got rich first and then now uh, want to invest elsewhere. I think there's mixed reasons why. There is some research to- It happens every time. Uh, every yeah, country. <laughs> right, there is this, uh, you know, one, one is that, you know, it's easier to buy now, it's a low, it's very low, property rights, you know, property is cheaper in the United States. Some of this they come to, to screw up as investment. Secondly, yes, there is a worry about long-term future. I mean, there's no question about it. People's, people are rational. They worry about, yes, they can make money today, they may not be able to. You know, they don't trust the regime, maybe they still have that, you know, problem with the trust. The, the, that's, that's a big, big issue, so they, they may try to get, most of the people might want to get an investment, or get a green card, and go back to China, continue to make money. And that, I think, is the, is the sort of rational way of that. And uh, so it does, I mean, you're right. I mean, it's, it's not completely uh, uh, groundless. The third question is much bigger. I think it's a very most important question. That is, is China has to, does China have to, can China bypass the so-called modernity industrial? That's, that's a very interesting question. It's a very big question for, you know, that's a, that's a big question. Yes, China has thought, you know, for a long time, modernization means urbanization, means industrialization, means big mega cities. Have they realized that's not the case? Yes, I think some people began to realize that that's not necessarily the case. And that's why I thought Mr. Xi's effort so, so valuable, so valuable because China's hope is still, I think, in the countryside. The countryside maybe is the where the problem, you know, if, the, if, if it's hard to educate urbanites saying, you know, don't, uh, you know, don't pollute or don't, you know, sort of a, somehow uh, try to live a life that's quite reduced the emission and so on. It's, it's difficult. Maybe in the countryside, by doing so, by doing that kind of a, you know, strong work, maybe that could help. You know, I, I don't have an answer. You know, it seems to me that I would love to have China to bypass that, but it's easier for us to live in the United States in a post-industrial society who suffer the consequences and tell them, don't do it. Don't drive a car. You know, buy, ride bicycle. I mean, that's easy for her to say. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, 
it, no question. I think it's a very, very, it's a challenging question. I don't think that China has the right answer. I mean, I find the answer yet. You know, because all developing countries, all the emerging markets are struggling. India is going to struggle with this. India, I think India is, it's, it's, India is, is a, no comparison. To no, China. but it's repeating that, you know, they're, yeah. they're polluting yeah. first. No, they're, 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 they're the that's river is worse. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're polluting first and they, because they think that's the necessary path, right? Is it not? We don't, you know, that's an interesting question. I mean, yes, we say it probably is not, but we are in postmodern, or we have already been industrialized. Then can we tell the people who are not industrialized, say, don't industrialize. Go back to the primitive uh, way of yeah, life. We screwed that up break. our environment, but, don't, but we won't let right. you. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's <laughs> I don't know. It's, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. What, what's, what's also a problem is if you uh, uh, jump, if you skip industrialization, what you have is companies who with many fewer people make much more money. But you need to create no. uh, something where you, you give people, they, they all have to end up in the service industry. So you have the top people, if you look at Facebook, uh, in the social networks, how much money they make, or wealth, whether it's real or artificial is another question, but how much they create with how few people, and you compare that with a Siemens GE or any other multinational company, uh, then you can, yeah. how, how few people are needed. So at the end, if we look uh, further ahead, we have a, a, a small group of very well-off people, and then you have a, a large group of people who uh, end up with uh, service jobs not well paid, and that uh, really the, the, the big middle class where does it where does it fit into that uh, system? It goes away. Yeah. Let, it let goes me also away. bring bring Bujang, Doris and, and Mr. Shea together on, on, on the on the sort of the, the, the question of again this is also related whether we can bypass that or not. Using again is the, the the kind of positive example that Mr. Shea and and, and, and the Netflix cited, I actually thought, yes, you also mentioned that crisis bring opportunities. But precisely because the disaster, that actually brought opportunity for Mr. Xie and the kind of village yeah. you saw. Absolutely. Now the question is without it. Then Jeffrey Johnson, it Jeffrey Johnson will tell you, he designed a very nice postmodern, <laughs> ecologically friendly small town for a town, for, for a town that commissioned him to do so, for, for the China lab, you know, Columbia Business School. They designed very, they presented in, uh, in March, and they paid money for them to design. Guess what, after they all designed a very eco-friendly one for this small city of Jiaxing, and guess what the answer is? Ah, uh, they shelved it. They spent money, and they don't give a damn about it. That's how, that's, it's a, that's because a number may think, maybe you need disaster. I'm sorry, but you, maybe you need disaster regions. So that, and that's what I asked you, Mr. Xie. What about your rest of the, the project? You said in Hebei and there other ends. In an ordinary, in ordinary situation, can you push your ecologically friendly housing in the countryside? That's a very important to know. You may want to use one. Yes, okay. I'll give you a little bit. This, the continuity of this thing is, this thing is, is, basically, we have to change all of the things in the house. We have to change all of the things in the house. Mm -hmm. When we talk about sustainability, it um, has to do with um, um, living and the way how we eat and the way how we um, transport and dwell with everything. This is, we have to restructure the civilization. It's the responsibility of everybody, so we shouldn't... Um, Push it to um, should, who should be responsible for it? Why is New York's weather so bad? Because all the factories are in the third world. Why is the sky in New York so blue? Because all the factories are in the developing world. A hundred years ago, New York was not like this. A hundred years ago, New York sky is not like this. Uh, China, because it's been so long, so it's still a chance to come back. Um, China is only following this bad habits for a very short time, so maybe there's still time for us to fix it. 
，这是一个非常有效率的呃的国家，它可以盖那种完全没有用的桥，这是非常有效率的国家。It's a country with high efficiency. It can build bridges with no use. So it has a lot of opportunity to solve such a big problem. There's a lot of opportunity for the Chinese government to solve the problem. This is a great point. That's a great point. No, I still want to know. No, no, no. Because at an operational level, how would other Hebei? So how could the Hebei ask you to do this without disaster? No, Hebei. 把我们赶走。That's that's even now we're coming out. So you said that Hebei because he showed the Hebei model because I know Hebei I'm sort of from that region. That's not disaster region. So I was curious how could they do for Hebei because that doesn't fit my image of local governments in China. And he said they kick him out. That's the last word he said. No, seriously. So not that that does yeah. 我我是完全可以谅解把我们赶走。因为要了解这事情太难了，对吧？包括我们现在的，哎，我们现在这个美国这边的盖房子，房子怎么没有盖这种东西？当然有了，他要改变这种方式也是很难的。所以你要面对这个可持续的挑战，这个是新的，这是最大的挑战。好，连马克思主马那个《资本论》都要重写啦。简单讲是这样，这是人类文明重构。So um um. Yeah, we were not surprised we got we got kicked out of Hebei, and um, because the the way how we um operate is very difficult for most people to understand. Even though um this kind of system could have realized in in the United States, but it couldn't. So let's go back to um my statement again. Uh, this has to do with uh, the restructure of civilization, and maybe we had to rewrite what capitalism is. Well, we uh, we have been invited to come to Hubei. We haven't made it yet, but maybe we should go together. <laughs> <laughs> maybe one more question. No, it's really late, so yeah. Uh, you have a question. I I just did. Uh, so today's topic about the future of sustainability, but one the very important policy in China is the land policy. So all these kind of rapid urbanization due to that kind of. State-owned land and all that kind of corruption are due to that system too. Like all these kind of government, business, private, this kind of corruption, bad side. So my question is, what do you think the future of this kind of land policy? Like, is there any possibility that the Chinese state may somehow privatize the land, or what the possible future for this kind of land? Oh, land, land, land. land. Well, I think. Uh, uh, Jiang Jun and, and, and Nesbitt would also tell you there's some local local experiment of not outright sale of the rights, uh, of ownership rights, but they do now, for example, the land lease in countryside can be resell. So the lease right, the user right can be resell, resell, re, re, uh, can, be, can be resold. So the resell, uh, the sell, selling, the sale of user right, which is long term, in countryside is 30, Right, and maybe some even argue that user right, that lease should be longer, as in the city, like 30, 70 years. But so one could maybe imagine someday that in the countryside, right? I don't, I don't think the urban is a different story. Urban is a different story. In the countryside, the land may be not outright privatized, but you can have a long-term user right. I think that's in the near future, that's no, probably. Well, the, 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 the central government changed the, the policy on that so they could resell and so forth just this year, early in the first part of this year. But that was a central government decision. That's yeah, but again, right. that's only resell the lease rights, but not, right. no, and yeah. also only no, well, in some everything's areas. Leased. What? Everything's leased. What? Everything's leased. Right. Yeah. Because the government owns, the country owns the land. Right. Everything's leased. 100%. 呃，关于土地私有化的问题，当然很多的讨论啊。那，呃，私有化要到公有要革命，那公有要到私有一念之间，好，所以这个事情是要非常非常的小心。就再回来一个。This has been a lot of discussion about um the land ownership from um privately owned to um public owned. It takes revolution. But from um, public, from public to um, private, it takes one day. Uh, one just one thought. Take one. So it has to be. This has this process has to be very, very careful. Oh. 
Privately yeah, it's very fast. Like, yeah, yeah. And overnight, meaning that you can't redo, re yeah. redo the, the thing. Yeah, so yeah. you better be careful. Yeah. But that's, uh, ironically, the advice in the last 30 years from, uh, you know, for privatization is actually mostly, much of it from ta uh, Taiwan. <laughs> there are a lot of the economists from, uh, you know, uh, 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 just the farmers have to have their land ownership from Taiwan. So I'm interested, it's interesting that someone from Taiwan actually is from The private ownership in, in Taiwan <laughs> so the started in, in 1967. Yeah, okay. That's right. That's also, there is a land reform. That's, in, that's in 1967. And, and the, uh, they took the land away from the landlords and gave them stock in companies. And the, and the landlord said, oh my god, that's terrible. But in the end, the stock in companies turned out to be very bad. <laughs> Another story. The Taiwan situation is very, very different from mainland, and, right. yeah, of course. Yeah. And the uh, Jiu did not so, so good in, in the mainland also. But uh, basically, Taiwan has much less population. and. Uh, and uh, uh, actually, the situation when when Chiang Kai Shi entered into Taiwan is also very different. And he knows all the experience that communism, how communism was Im implemented in in the mainland, and he knows how how serious uh, that the uprise of the peasant can can be. And uh, he also brings a lot of uh, gold and uh, capitals and. Uh, he got a lot of sponsorship from the United States at the time, which actually is his primary, what we said, capital, uh, primary accumulation of capital, so on and so forth. So the context is very, very different. And uh, the, as, uh, in terms of the complexity of Chinese uh, rural countryside, I, I also believe uh, uh, what Xi uh, just said, that it's really very easy, but could be much mistake to privatize. So, so far, actually, you can say it's uh, de facto privatized. Of course, it's, everything is really like privatized, right? So let's wait and see how it affects, and then this is kind of a laboratory, uh, laboratory model. But uh, 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 about the, uh, the conflicts uh, or the, uh, how to say, the update of civilization, conflicts of civilization, uh, <coughs> Chinese industrialization was compelled. And uh, it's really like rejecting for a long time, but compelled into this modernization because China used to be very, very rich in a society uh, in the late 19th uh, 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 century, could be top of the world. And China, India used to be like an over 50% of the global GDP, but you can check the beginning of this century is really like shrinking dramatically. And uh, the state uh, used to be very weak. Uh, and uh, there is a di uh, distinction between the state and the society, in which the society is really, re really rich and strong. However, there is reform, of course, revolution reform. And finally, the whole rural society becomes so marginalized, so poor. The education system and the medical system, which used to function in the rural society, totally di dismantled, deconstructed. So. Uh, there is a contradiction between a strong state and a strong society, but China choose to uh, reinforce the state first, I have to say, because uh, Mao, especially Mao, although he made uh, very big made, made, made mistakes in industrialization and cultural revolution, however, he is still maintained a minimum social welfare system, you give free, free houses, uh, uh, free medical system, especially a very big coverage of the medical system to the society. And uh, the average age before the liberation is around 35 years old. And uh, by the end of the 1970s, it's uh, 75. But into the 1980s, it's going back again a little bit because the medical system is also marginalized again. So this is a conflict. The conflict is that state society and strong and rich so on and so forth. And another conflict is that how to allocate so many peasants to be industrialized. Uh, they are very, very less skilled, and when they come up to the uh, factory, uh, they are actually very cheap labor because they never attend. But uh, uh, very recently, I noticed that after the global crisis in 2007, uh, when a lot of migrant workers come, uh, was laid off from the coastline factories, uh, the government, uh, especially in, in, in Sichuan, for example, uh, uh, one of the cities, Yongchuan, and Hechuan, especially Yongchuan, the government, local government, actually uh, set up a lot of training schools, uh, and uh, they claimed also one of the manifesto, uh, manifesto is that we want to be the training school centers of the hinterland migrant workers. 
And uh, most of the education was very, very low education fee and even free, so that the cheap laborers can be ed educated to be prepared for the next uh, industrialization. I mean, from cheap labor, labor intensive to technology intensive, and so on and so forth, and the capital intensive. So uh, that is uh, also contra contradiction, that we have so many subdue, uh, how to say, uh, surplus, surplus uh, labor to deal with, how to uh, deal with all the situation. Another issue I want to respond to is about the housing, housing issue. And the housing issue, uh, uh, I just mentioned that we made a lot of mistakes, especially in recent five years, but at least the central government want to control the housing prices, uh, especially in 2003, but failed. Because 2003, there is a SARS. In 2003, the first fire about giving affordable housing and social housing was launched, but finally abandoned because of the SARS. And uh, uh, the government have to balance between two options. One option is that given affordable housing, and uh, uh, decrease the speed of the, the, the economy, increase uh, growth, uh, growth, and uh, keep the uh, this commercial real estate market as a pillar industry, and uh, keep it high, but uh, less people will buy, uh, can uh, afford the houses. So finally, I choose the second one because 2003, uh, when the, all the other countries really like going really down and even decrease, but China has 9.1 percent of their economic growth. And then we can also notice that there's a step by step step. The housing price really <coughs> increased like this, but every year you can see the central government launch a lot of issues until uh, this year is really, really hard measures in controlling social, uh, the, the, the housing prices. Because now the disparity of the income and housing prices is number one of the world. It is dramatically uh, very, very dangerous. And another thing I want to say is about the heritage that we inherited from, from the socialism time, I mean the traditional socialism time. The collective land in the rural countryside is one factor that China has no slums because uh, that is the one of the minimum social wa welfare that government gave to the peasant. And that is also one of the reasons the government are, is very careful not to privatize the, uh, the land in the rural countryside because the people when they laid off from the coastline they can come back and become a father, father, father again. So they have options between uh, workers and peasants. And uh, collective land in the cities has played another role. Uh, the role is that they afford the urban villages to all these migrant workers. Although the, urban, the, 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 the villagers of urban villages become very rich, and uh, however, they, anyway, they provide these houses to the villagers. So this is also kind of uh, heritage. And that is uh, one important reason that land cannot be easily privatized. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Thank yeah. you, panelists and guests. And thank you, audience, for saying. There's also, just a reminder, that there's also an event tomorrow night at Studio X. I'll take the Eco Brand, the final event uh, this year. About uh, cities and groups. Thank our speakers again.